Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Congress. Thank you for journey messages you've given to all your people, your children, your servants, our brothers and sisters and ministers. We thank you, Lord, because we're here gathered together to be blessed of you so that we can be channels of blessings to all the churches and all the fellowships we came from. Lord, we're praying that this will be an enriching time in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We know that your people have come over a long journey and many of us might be tired physically. We pray that you quicken us in the inner man in Jesus' name. And we pray that your word will still benefit every one of us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, I pray. I welcome every one of you to this uh, Congress of this year. And I bless the name of the Lord for granting every one of us journey mercies to be here. The Lord who has brought you here will actually enrich your life and enrich your ministry so that every one of us will be better in ministry in Jesus' name. This uh, year's uh, strategy Congress for the leaders is actually special. You will see that the messages are very enriching and uh, the seminars are enriching as well. In the series I'll be dealing with, I'm dealing with leadership. And uh, if you look at your outline that is on the program page, you'll see what we've done there. We've uh, spelled out the word leadership. And each of the letters we have made uh, to actually represent an essential quality and characteristic in the life and ministry of the leader. L for love. E for effectiveness. A for anointing. D for discipline. E for exploits, and R for resourcefulness, S for supernatural signs, H for holiness, I for intercession, and P for progress. So we'll be dealing with the series, and I'm believing that the Lord will help us really see quite a lot. I'm going to tell you at the beginning, I'm appealing to you, I'm instruct, I'm a kind of counseling you like a father to his own sons and daughters, that you need to get all the messages as a series together. Because everything ties together. Love in Christ-like leadership, effectiveness of competent leaders, and the anointing for consecrated leaders, discipline of crucified leaders, exploits of charismatic leaders, the resourcefulness of creative leaders, science for commissioned leaders, and the holiness in Christian leadership as well as uh, intercession by compassionate leaders and progress through courageous leadership. I want you to even begin to book maybe from tonight or tomorrow because we need the whole series together. There's a lot the Lord is going to reveal to us. And you pay for everything together, all the ten messages. Not that you pay for the nine and then the last one you are not able to pay for them because we're giving it as the last. Everything ties together and believing that you are going to climb the ladder of success this year. And your ministry will be spectacular in Jesus' name. Uh, because I spoke about buying and cassettes and money, looks like your amen has gone. I said you will buy all the cassettes. God bless every one of you. Tonight we're talking about love in Christ-like leadership. I won't keep you for a long time. I know you are tired already. And we're going to have uh, this message and we'll look at the Christ-like leadership. That is the leadership style of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 50, I'm reading from verse 4. In Isaiah chapter 50, we're looking at verse 4. And uh, we want to see about the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophecy that went on before him. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the lineage, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, and he wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned that's talking about the lord jesus christ and that's talking about him as a perfect servant and as a perfect leader that the lord has given us yes we know his savior is lord as well and he is the leader we're looking at isaiah chapter 55 in isaiah chapter 55 reading from verse 4 isaiah chapter 55 reading from verse 4 behold i have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. That's the Lord Jesus Christ that we are learning about in life and ministry. Christ is our model. Christ is our mentor. And Christ is our master. 
if you are looking for a model to follow in leadership the model of jesus christ is the perfect one is an only one is the one that will not lead any one of us astray it's not only a model it's a mentor it's the one that takes us up he molds our lives and he makes us the leaders we ought to be and he is the master he himself said you call me lord and master and you say well and what i have done you ought to do in his leadership pattern love is a first quality and love is a foundation of all other characteristics. As you look at the qualities of the Christian life, and you look at the qualities of the leadership style of the Lord Jesus Christ, love is a, is a very first characteristic. And love is a foundation of all the other leadership characteristics that we may have. And of course, L is the first letter of that word, leadership. And the Lord has so arranged it that love, very important, very essential, is what we ought to follow in our leadership. Following Christ, love is a gauge and a guide. As you are leading the people of God, and you're asking yourself, what's the gauge? What's the guide of my leadership? Then you understand, love should be the gauge and love should be the guide. Not only that, number two, love is a model and love is a measure anything you are going to do you may not understand what you ought to do at a particular time what direction you ought to go at a particular time what counseling you ought to give at a particular time and what action you ought to take what decision you ought to take in a particular time because of the ministry the ministry the model is love the measure is love number three love is the passion and the power of christ-like leadership the passion of our heart and the pursuit of our life and the power of our leadership should be the love that characterizes the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest indeed is love. As you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you will see what the word of God is telling us. It says the greatest of all the qualities we can have, of all the gifts we can have, of all the graces we can have, of all the abilities we can have, and of all the skills that you may have for leadership or for your personal life, the greatest indeed is love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're reading from verse 1. Here we have the word of God telling us the essence of love and the importance of love, the indispensability of love. It tells us 1 Corinthians 13, reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, have not love, and become a sounding brass and of a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt and have not charity, it profited me nothing. You will see then how important love is, how essential love is, how, how indispensable love is. It tells us the characteristics of that love. And as we we have leadership and as we lead as we preach as we exhort as we help other people to grow in the ministry here are the characteristics that the lord wants us to think about charity or love suffereth long and is kind charity envieth not charity bunteth not itself is not popped up does not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own is not easily provoked thinketh no evil you see, as we lead, we're going to behave before the people. We're going to act before the people. We're going to interact before the people. And it says, charity or love will not behave in an uncomely manner, or seemingly, in a way that does not project or produce resource, good resource among the people of God. Seeketh not her own. Love will put others first, will put the good of others first, and will put the development and the growth of others first, and will put the growth of the church first. And wanteth not itself is not up. There will be no pride at all in love. The skills you have, the ability you have, the position you have, the privilege you have, the authority you have, or whatever it is that you have. Then he tells us he does not, he, he does not rejoice in iniquity, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, sopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth in leadership. There are times other qualities may not succeed immediately. And there are times other characteristics may not come up immediately. But in any area of ministry, we need to understand how indispensable this is, how important this is, how essential this is. Because charity, love, and leadership in ministry never faileth. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and prophesy in part. But when that we 
which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I speak as a child. I'm telling you this word we have been talking about. When I was a child, that was in the past. The years that were gone, the past years. And there were things we did in the past, childish things. And Paul the Apostle said, now that we're in leadership, now that we're in ministry, now that we're helping other people, now that we're focusing their attention to heaven, and now that we're focusing their attention to salvation, to the kingdom of God, to the glory of God, all those childish things that we did before we came into the ministry, all those things are gone. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, a man in ministry, a man in leadership, a man in the work of God, a man in the service of God, when I became a man, I put away childish things. As we look at uh, the leadership of many people, you might find there were some childish things that, you know, some leaders did. They may not even be sinful. They may not even be something that is destructive completely, but they're childish. And the people looking at the leadership style of those people, uh, they couldn't actually accept their leadership. And they couldn't benefit much from their leadership because they were so childish in their leadership approach. It says, but now I'm becoming a man, a man in service, a man in ministry, and a man in leadership. It says, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass, darkly. But then, face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I'm known. And now, abideth faith, hope, charity, that is love, these three. But the greatest of these is charity the greatest indeed is love supreme love for god our creator our redeemer the father of our lord jesus christ and the one that so loved the world so much he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life and the one that has selected us and called us into the ministry what kind of love should we have for him number one supreme love for god number two sacrificial love for sinners the sinners that jesus died for the sinners that Jesus has come to save, the sinners that is shed his blood for, we should have sacrificial love for them. Number three, sanctifying love for believers. We're leading the believers. We're developing the believers. We're growing the believers. We're discipling the believers. And we're maturing the believers. And because of that, we only do that with love. And it should be sanctifying love for the believers. Number four, submissive love for God's word. The instrument in our hand, the weapon in our hand, by which we'll be able to carry out our ministry, by which sinners will be converted, by which believers will be matured, and by which we'll prepare the people of God for glory, for heaven, for the rapture, is the word of God. And we need to have submissive love for that word. Number five, sincere love for the work of God. The work the Lord has given us to do. We need to have real love, sincere love for that word. To lead demands that we love. Love God supremely. Love sinners sacrificially. Love believers with sanctifying love. And love the word of God with submission. And love the work of God with sincerity. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, following Christ as Lord and Master. Following Christ as Lord and Master. Number two, feeding Christ's church with his life-giving message. Feeding Christ's church with his life-giving message. Number three, focusing on Christ's leadership model. I come to number one, following Christ as Lord and Master. Actually, when the Lord called his own disciples, he called them into salvation and service at the same time. He was calling them to salvation. He was calling them to service. He was calling them to become saved. He was calling them to also serve. He was calling them to become the sons of God. He was calling them that they'll become his servants as well. In Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 19. Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. And he says unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you. He had the ministry in mind. He had the work they were to do in mind. He had their servanthood in mind. And he had the ministry of leadership, of apostleship in mind. When he called them and he said, I'm going to make you what you ought to be. You have not discovered your life's profession. You have not discovered your life's ministry. You have not discovered your life's goal. I'm going to show that to you. And I'm going to make you do it. And the way you are going to come to it is that you will follow me. 
there was an initial following of the Lord, there was a continual following of the Lord. They were to rise up and follow him immediately. That's into salvation. And then they'll be following him in every characteristic, every quality, everything they did in his moral life, spiritual life, in his dynamic life. They were to follow the Lord. And as they followed the Lord, he said, you'll be following me and then it will be a process of making you what you ought to be, the servants you ought to be, the leaders you ought to be, and the great apostles you ought to be. I will make you the fishers of men. In talking about fishers of men, he's talking about evangelists. In talking about fishers of men, he's talking about pastoral ministry. In talking about fishers of men, he's talking about the apostleship. In talking about fishers of men, he's talking about them as the servants of the Lord. I'll be sending you to throw the net of the gospel into the sea of humanity. And then you'll be fishers of men. You'll be bringing them into the net of the gospel and into the ship of the kingdom. And so the Lord then is telling us, if the Lord is going to make us what we ought to be, we need to follow him. And you know that the most important and the most visible and the most dynamic in the characteristics and the qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ is his love. And he has called us to follow him in love. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. 1 Peter chapter, chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 21. Here he tells us, I will ought to follow him. For even here unto are ye called. Because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. He has called us. And the calling he has called us is to follow after him. And to live like him. And to love like him. And to learn of him. And to do what he would have done. That's actually that's the reason why we should be conscious of the Lord Jesus Christ every time. Putting the Lord before us every time. And the question should be on your lips every time. What would Jesus do? Are you a leader of the people of God? What would Jesus do? At there times you get tired and the people still need your attention. What would Jesus do? Are there needs in the lives of the people? You are called as a leader to meet those needs. What would Jesus do? Is there anybody that is mistakenly getting into error and you need to correct and then you have the tendency of giving up and saying, even if you correct, they are not going to listen. What will Jesus do? Is there anybody that is trying his best but the best is not measuring up and you feel like you're know, displacing that individual? What would Jesus do? Is there anybody that is slow in getting your leadership and in getting the teaching and the training that you are given? Are you going to abandon them and pick other people? The question is, what did Jesus do? We are to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in our leadership style, in everything that we do, in the relationship we have with the people of God, with the servants of the Lord, and with the workers that are working under us, and with the ministry in the church. What will Jesus do will be the question every time. And we know that whatever Jesus will do will be based on love. Because Jesus acted and Jesus spoke and Jesus did everything that he did in love. Even when he corrected people, it was in love. And when he commended people, it was in love. And therefore, let us bring this into our hearts. That we want to follow the leadership style of Jesus Christ. We're following Christ as Lord and as Master. In John chapter 13. John chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should be de that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That's what Jesus did. That's how Jesus led, and that's how we ought to lead. We ought to lead with love. We ought to lead with the understanding that God is love and Jesus Christ manifested that practical love in leading his own people. And if you look at the lives of the disciples of Jesus, as was discipling them, developing them, training them, perfecting them, showing them the way they ought to go. There were many, many things that happened in the midst of those disciples, but every time Jesus spoke in love. Every time Jesus acted in love. Every time Jesus related with them in love. And then he brought them from the level they were and brought them to a higher level. And the Lord is calling us as leaders. That we are to follow the leadership pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the very end. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1, here we are told in the word of God how we ought to follow the Lord. And the characteristic in particular we ought to follow we are told here. 
Here he tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, looking at verse 1, be, be ye therefore followers of God as their children. And if the children are to follow God, how much more the sons and the daughters? How much more the ministers? How much more the servants of God? How much more the people that have got the privilege of serving other people, serving the people of God, serving the church of the living God? Follow God, followers of God as their children. In what way? Verse 2, and walk in love. And walk in love. And live in love. And act in love. And conduct yourself in love. And relate with the members of the church in love. You are making an announcement, act in love. You are correcting something, do it in love. You are training the people, do it in love. You are trying to point out something that, hey, this is not okay, church. Do it this way, say it in love. And you are trying to improve on the quality of service, all the other workers and members of the ministry that they are putting forth, do it in love. Just ask yourself, if Jesus were here, and Jesus were training these workers, and Jesus were training these people in service, developing them, bringing them up, how will he do it? He'll do it in love, walk in love, as Christ also has loved us. About we made our own mistakes in the past years, what did, what did Jesus do? He loved us. And every time we made a mistake, uh, he didn't just, you know, take us, throw, it, throw us away. Because if he did that, he'll never have anybody. Think about Peter. He made his own mistakes. Jesus loved him. Think about John and James. James and John, they made their mistakes and Jesus loved them. Yes, he corrected them. Yes, he put them in place. And yet, he involved them. And he didn't abandon them totally and permanently. He loved them. Walk in love. And we who represent Christ, and we who are working for the Lord, that's what we are to do. In training the people of God, in training the workers in the church, and in helping the members of the church that they should be what they ought to be. Yes, we'll teach sound doctrine. Jesus taught sound doctrine. Yes, we're going to tell the people to beware of false prophets and Pharisees and Christ. But every, we can say it in love. There'll be love in your tone. There'll be love in your appearance. There'll be taught love in your disposition, in your facial appearance. Do it in love. It says, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, I'm looking at it from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory. In the work we're doing for the Lord. There are times the temptation will come to forget ourselves and to forget love and to forget that whatever, however good that thing may be that we're doing, however useful and profitable that thing may be that we're doing, however rewardable that thing is that we're doing, however important, indispensable uh, the things we're doing. You see, there are times we forget ourselves and we think what I'm doing is the greatest. If I don't do this, the ministry will not be complete. If I'm not there, the thing will not be done. And that kind of air, that kind of attitude, I'm so important, I'm so indispensable. Without me, the, you know, the, the church cannot move on, can bring vain glory, can bring pride, can even bring strife. And you can become a little God by yourself. And the privilege you have will corrupt you. But when you understand that Christ is a model, and Christ is our mentor, and Christ is our master, and Christ is our Lord, and He is a perfect example. And the leadership, if we're going to succeed in leadership, we must follow Christ. And then we're not going to do anything through strive of in glory. In verse 3, it says, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem all the better than themselves. That means, uh, you know, as we're ministering, if we're doing it in love, you're not going to put down other ministries and then raise and lift up your own ministry. Ours is the most important. Don't mind them. Don't mind the other ones. Don't mind what they do. If we do everything they're doing, we don't do what we're doing. What do you think the church will be? That's not good. That's not love. But you're lowly. You're meek. You're submissive. Because that's love. That's how we serve the people of God. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not trouble to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Made himself of no reputation. What causes this problem for leadership? I am English. 
region overseer. You are language region overseer. And please don't forget, don't think that overseer is overseer. We are not equals. Stay in your place and I stay in my place. We are not equals. I'm greater than you are. Huh. Think about that. Reputation. And I want to blow up who we are. Magnify who we are. And then impose ourselves on the other people. And diminish the other person's ministry so that we will be able to have a higher ministry. If possible, destroy his ministry. So that they will know we are the people that really have the essential ministry. And if we don't have a two feet to stand and a good place to stand, he will not have a place to stand. That's not love. That's not love. When you carry out your ministry to the point in a way you destroy the ministry of the other, or you hinder the ministry of the other, or you diminish the ministry of the other, or you belittle the ministry of the other, that's not love. But the Lord is calling us to love and is telling us that Jesus has made himself of no reputation, but he took upon him the form of a servant. And he was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, our Lord and Master. He humbled himself, the great God of heaven, the one that said, I am that I am, and the one that said, I am Alpha and Omega, the Amen, the faithful, and the one that is higher than the angels. He humbled himself. It's because of his love, his love in condescension. And therefore, as we follow the leadership style of Jesus, we want to understand, as I'm talking to my brother, I need to humble myself. And as I'm carrying out my ministry, so that the others will benefit, allow the others to carry on their ministries too, I humble myself. It says he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, even to the death of the cross, wherefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, the way up, is down and the way to be high is to be lowly uh, that that means then we're learning from the lord jesus christ what to follow his leadership style uh, as you think about yourself as you think about your ability as you think about your calling as you think about the activities of ministry that you are to get involved in how you to do it you have to think in humility and in love you have to think and giving other people space you stand in ministry let me also stand let him also stand. Let her also stand. We all have ministries. Uh, you know, sometimes there are times where we almost, uh, you know, want to blot out uh, the women ministry in a locality. Uh, because they ought to know that here I am, here I stand. I can do it all. But you cannot. That's why the Lord has given us. And first he gave apostles and then prophets and then evangelists and pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the defining of the body of Christ. That we all will come together in unity, matured standing. He does it so, she does it so, and I do my own. That's how the ministry will stand. And we respect one another, we love one another. We give the understanding that I have something to give, you have something to give. You give me my chance, I give you your chance. That's how the ministry will continue. And we do that all in love. We're looking at Luke chapter 6 and verse 40. Luke chapter 6 verse 40, the disciple is not above his master. But everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. When last did you hear that, hear that word? Perfect. Be therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Perfection is our goal. Perfection is a target. Perfection is our desire. Perfection is his demand. And it says the disciple, the upcoming leader, he should not just be satisfied the way he is. I'm all right the way I am. The way I'm preaching, I cannot do better. This is all I can do. We should do better. The way I'm talking to the congregation, that's the way I am. I'm just, just going to be myself. I'm not going to pretend. I cannot do better than this. Of course, you will do better. And the way I've been correcting the people, uh, that's, that's who I am. That's who I am. I don't know how to talk soft and talk gentle. You must know. You must have love. There must be a change. And it is that change that is making us to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. As we consider the love of Christ in leadership, what do we know of the characteristic of his love? Number one, compassionate. Number two, considerate. Number three, corrective. Number four, constant. Number five, conciliatory. 
Number six, constructive. Number seven, contagious. As we manifest love in our leadership style, the, the style or the love should be compassionate. If the people are suffering, have compassion. If the people are having some pain, so they're having some pressure on them, have compassion. And if, uh, you know, maybe some of the people are late to church, and uh, ask, ask them reasons why they are late. Don't just bump on them and, you know, begin to crush them and begin to speak against them. Be compassionate. If some people have some peculiar weaknesses, and those weaknesses, they're slow in correcting them. Be compassionate. Number two, be considerate. What the people are going through here we are in a great congregation how can we know what we're passing through or the background we're coming from and it's when you talk to the people if it's when you ask questions from the people you will not know from you'll know from where they are coming and you will know where the where the shoe is pinching them you, you'll know where the problem is overbearing in their lives and then you are considerate and then you are correcting you are correcting you look at the, the, the lives of the members and you look at the lives of the workers that you are training and then you want your love to be corrective and then it, your love is constant like the love of the Lord Jesus having loved his own he loved them even to the very end and you are conciliatory conciliatory and you know Jesus Christ brought his own disciples together and he did that in different ways sometimes he did it by quietness what I mean is this if he had told them from the very first week and from the very first month they came together, uh, do you know that this Judas Iscariot is a, is a bad fellow? Is a bad egg in this in the basket? Is a rotten egg in the basket and is going to corrupt everybody else? And if Jesus Christ has told everything to John the Beloved, the one that he loved very much, do you know this Judas says, God, go and tell Peter, tell James and tell Andrew and tell the other people, this Judas, I'm telling you this, what he's going to do. That will have created rage, confusion, conflict among them, suspicion among them. Because Jesus did not have the method of divide and rule. They do that in the world. They poison the mind of these people so that they'll be able to set these people against them. And so they'll be able to rule them when they're divided. Jesus never did that. He was constant in love. He was conciliatory. And there was a time that James and John came. Uh, and then they said, Lord, you want to dis uh, we're requesting something from you. What do you want? For James to sit on this side and John to sit on the other side. And they left Peter out. And they left Andrew out. And they let all the others out. And when the ten added, they were filled with indignation. What do you mean? You are here. You are there. They wanted to start fighting for position. And Jesus brought them together. He reconciled them. You know the kings of the world. You know how they do. It will not be so among you. Why don't you look at my example? I am among you as he that serveth. And then he brought them together again. And then before he led, he prayed for their unity that they all may be one. And that is what we need to do in leadership. Our love should be compassionate. Our love should be considerate. Our love should be corrective. Our love should be con uh, constant. Our love should be conciliatory. Our love should be constructive constructive and uh, you cannot be constructive you are not thoughtful uh, you don't jump into a situation before you you know what to do you'll be constructive what there's something wrong here how can i correct this how do i correct disorder so that the disorder will not be magnified be constructive here is a person that is not uh, it's not measuring up he's not doing as he ought to do how do i bring him to become a better leader a better worker a better servant of god be constructive how do we construct well there are times we have to pull down some things that god told jeremiah i've called you and i've appointed you that you will pull down and that you will throw down and that you will dig out and then you will plant and you will build we must be constructive in our leadership style number seven contagious love that when the people see, it, it even happens in the family. If the daddy and the mommy, if they are in love together and the children observe them, you are going to find the children in that family, they are going to love one another. We never see daddy and mommy fighting. We never see them again. The love is going to pass on, spill over to the children. Let your love be so visible and constructive that the children will see, the people we're leading will see, and then the love will pass on to them. I'm coming to point number two, feeding Christ's church with his life-giving message. Feeding the church of Christ with his life-giving message. And we do that in love. In fact, you cannot feed the church of God the way you ought to feed them without love. We're told in John chapter 21 how Jesus asked Peter, 
And as Jesus was asking Peter, he, here is, uh, here is uh, what uh, assignment he gave him after he, he affirmed his love for him. In John chapter 21 verse 15, so when they are dying, Jesus says unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Lovest thou me but more than these? Because you know there are many things that are trying to crave, that are trying to catch the attention of our lives. And they want our attention, our job, our profession, our fishing, our throwing net into the sea and catching a lot. Do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, I love you. Thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. The evidence that we love God is that we feed the children of God. We cannot just say, I love God, I love God, with emotional love, sentimental love. We must do something. And the greatest thing we can do is to feed the people of God with the word of God. Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He says unto him, yes, Lord, yea, Lord, that knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, then feed my sheep. Feed the young ones. Feed the growing ones and feed my sheep too. And then in verse 17, he says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? Now, do you see the method of Jesus in his love? Do you see the method of Jesus in his uh, correction? Do you see how Jesus even didn't mention anything about Peter? Hmm. Do you remember what I told you? That you are going to deny me and you said no never and you said that even if everybody denied me you were not going to deny me and you see how you fell and your back was to the ground and you disgraced yourself and you even told them even when i'm forgiving you now but i just i'm just reminding you how terrible you are being and peter did i hear you cursing and swearing never and you know there are some leaders that think they think we are bold we as leaders when you talk to somebody it's not something bad and then you don't allow them to save their face. You don't allow them to recover from the blow that they've got already. And then you remind them, the other time this is what you did. The other time this is what you did. And we speak to them in such a way that they never think they can come up again. Because we think they have failed so much. And they think they have failed so much. But Jesus will never do that. Because he manifested love in his leadership style. And then he just said, do you love me? Yes, I love you. All right, feed my lambs. Peter, don't go yet. Do you love me? Of course you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, come here. This is the third time. Without Jesus mentioning what had happened three times before, we should have wisdom. In imprinting something in the hearts of people, sometimes we do it with action. Sometimes we do it with silence. Sometimes we simply ask questions. And then if the spirit directs those questions, the truth will be affirmed and imprinted in the hearts of the people without mentioning them. So that we don't cause unnecessary sorrow and discouragement. That's the love of God. The love will be associated with the wisdom of God in the way we relate to the people. And this thought time Peter was grieved because he said unto him, The thought time lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. And you will see the privilege that the Lord gave uh, this uh, Peter even later. Uh, what a kind, what knowledge, and what, a, what what example that gives us. Uh, when somebody has done something wrong, something foolish, even something that we might say that this is backsliding. How could you have done that? If we rebuke them, we're right. But we don't kill them by rebuking them. We show love. We show mercy. We show compassion on them. And then we allow them to still be useful to the Lord. And then when the leadership also, you know, brings them to a place of responsibility, the members will not go back, you know, at the background, in the backyard, talking and saying, why are they making brother so-and-so to do something? Why are they making sister so-and-so to do something? After all, everybody knows uh, what brother so-and-so did and what sister so-and-so did. And uh, why are they giving him opportunity? Is that his voice I'm hearing preaching over there? Is that his voice I'm hearing that is counseling people over there, controlling people in leadership again in that place? Uh, what are they doing in this church? Are they not better people than himself? What are you talking about? Where we want to come to the love of Jesus so that the love of Jesus will make us to forget what Peter has done. 
And because he has repented, he went out and wept bitterly. And that bitter weeping is to grant forgiveness and to attract the mercy and the love of God. And if Jesus has forgiven and God has forgiven, then the people of God, the church of God, ought to forget. In fact, uh, you know, it gladdens my heart that uh, when you come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, and then the prayer meeting was going on and Peter stood up and began to say he came into leadership again and as was in leadership again and said men and brethren this is what happened Judas is gone we're going to choose another person nobody said Peter can you sit down we we'll say remember it's still fresh in our mind it's not up to three months yet please sit down James can you please take over he doesn't have mouth to talk everybody accepted because they knew that Jesus had forgiven him. He is now in leadership. He is our leader again because he's our leader again. We listen. And that is the attitude the church of God ought to have. In Jeremiah chapter 3, Jeremiah chapter 3, we're looking at verse 15. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, here is the promise of the Lord concerning what he will do, and he'll give us good shepherds and good pastors. He says, And I will give you pastors according to my to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. When the Lord calls us, he calls us to love him. If we love him, we love his children, we love his church. If we love his church, we're going to feed the church of God, the people of God, with knowledge, with understanding. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, says the Lord, they shall say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers, but I said in verse uh, 19 now but i said shall i put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land a goodly heritage of the host of the nation and i said thou shalt be thou shalt call me my father and shall not turn away from me and that's what the pastors will do that's what the leaders will do they'll feed us with knowledge and with understanding and when they feed us with knowledge and understanding it will bring cleansing to our lives it will bring something good to our lives and then will be a praise unto the lord and will be a glory unto the unto the name of the lord acts of the apostles chapter 20. in acts of the apostles chapter 20 i'm reading from verse 26 acts chapter 20 I'm reading from verse 26 wherefore i take you to record this day that i'm pure from the blood of all men for i have not shown to declare unto you the all the counsel of god that's paul in his love for the church in his love for the church he fed the church of god he declared the word of god unto them and the word of god he declared unto them was full and he said i have not neglected i have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He now turned thee to those leaders in Ephesus and he said in verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God. That's what you do. That's what you do. To feed the church of God. And feeding the church of God takes preparation. And sometimes you have some, uh, some leaders, and there's no doubt in my mind, looking at the lives of those leaders, they love, they love. Only that their love is not full and complete like that of Jesus Christ. They love, and you see how they care for the people, they follow up on the people, they visit the people, they discuss with the people, they counsel the people. The only thing is that in their preaching, there's not enough preparation. They do not prepare to give the bread of life to the people. Of course, I know they love, but they do not understand that our love also includes preparing the message and giving the very best that souls will be saved, that believers will be sanctified, and that sanctified believers will be filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's what we need to do. Let, let's, let's spend more time, quality time, preparing the message of life for the people of God, that you take it yourselves and to all the flock over the way the holy ghost has made you overseers that you will feed the church of god which he has purchased with his own blood 
especially in these days when there's so many false prophets around look at verse 29 for i know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the floor also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years i cease not to warn every one night and day with tears and now brethren i commend you to god and to the word of his grace the word that is the central thing in the ministry i commend you unto god and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up if we love the people we want them to be built up we want them to grow want him to be well equipped and what is going to do that is the word of his grace i commend you therefore to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified and will teach everyone even the people that uh, seem not to be getting much of the message will still keep on teaching them and will keep on praying for them while we're teaching them that the lord himself will make them to recover themselves from the snare of the devil we're looking at second timothy chapter 2 in second timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 24 the servant of the lord must not strive as we come here to this uh, congress and as we go over we go back to our ministries at home let's always remember we represent the lord in church outside the church in the vehicle in the taxi in the plane in the market with our in-laws a pastor is a pastor not only for two hours while he's preaching not only on sunday while he's ministry and counseling he's a pastor even when there's no service when there's no ministry he is a pastor even when he goes to market even when he follows his wife to the market or carries the wife to the market pastor is still pastor and the pastor must not strive and the servant of the lord must not strive and when you are having some if you are not on full time you're having some business interaction with people if you're a preacher you're a pastor and the man of god the woman of god the servant of the lord must not strive never but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves they don't know they are opposing themselves they think they are opposing you you're trying to get them out of sin into the savior they're opposing you and you're trying to make them better in the ministry they're opposing you and you're trying to make them higher get them higher yeah, on the ladder of progress but they're opposing you and you're trying to feed them but they're biting your hand they don't know they're hurting themselves they think they're hurting you and that's why the word of god is saying that even though they're doing that even though they're opposing you while well, they're they opposing themselves what well, they think they're opposing you in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God for adventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will and that's what the Lord is telling us the Lord is challenging us that we need to follow the Lord in love and when we follow the Lord in love we're going to feed the church of the living God and we feed them with a life-giving message of the Lord I come to point number three focusing on Christ's leadership model focusing on Christ's leadership model uh, many of us who are here we've had some experiences outside the church and you'll find many people like that you think about Moses for example he had some experiences outside leading the people of God Israel and you'll think about David he had some experiences in the jungle in the on the field before he was called to come and lead the people of God and you find paul the apostle he has some experiences too among the sanhedrin and the danger is that if you have been a leader in the world and there's a way you you conducted leadership in the world when you come into the church and you're now a leader if we're not careful the pattern of the political leaders you might be following that without knowing and all the strategies and all the methodologies of those leaders in the world if you're not careful you might be following them because if you have been a leader in the world, um, in, in any area, in any area, all the strategies you learn to the world, all the ideologies you learn to the world, all the techniques you learn to the world, how to make other people submit and make them do things. It might be effective in the world, and then you come to the church, but you understand, those methods 
and not fully the methods of Christ. And the Lord is telling us as you come to the Lord, as you come to the church, and now you're a leader in the church, go back to the word of God and focus on the leadership style of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, if we do that, then we'll be following after the Lord and he'll make us fishers of men. Our ministries will actually have the success and the progress that you ought to have. Let's come back to Isaiah again, chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, focusing on Christ's leadership model. Isaiah chapter 55, I'm reading from verse 4. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people behold thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not a nation that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the lord thy god and for the holy one of israel for he has glorified thee here the lord is telling us that christ will be the leader and that he'll be the leader of the people as a leader of the people, there will be Gentiles that will run after him. There will be Gentiles that will believe on him. And that's what has happened today. We have many Gentiles and many Gentile nations as they are following the Lord. And we are following the Lord from all Gentile nations in Africa too. And uh, that, that means that that has been fulfilled. But you see how Jesus Christ led in John chapter 15 verse 4. John chapter 15 reading from verse 4. Abide in me. Now in you. As a branch cannot be a fruit of itself except it abide in a vine no more can ye except ye abide in me i am the vine and ye are the branches he that abideth in me and i in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me ye can do nothing the lord is telling us in the privilege and ministry that has given us that we need to abide in him abide in him abide in him when we get angry over the congregation we're not abiding in him at that point when we correct something the way the political leaders of the world will have corrected it in their party we're not abiding in christ at that time and when we're boisterous and we're overbearing on the people of god that we're leading and they would do like you know those um, you know militant uh, powerful mighty people of the world how they crush uh, you know the people under them when we do that like the people of the world we're not abiding in christ at that time at that point and when we do things that uh, we know that if those things were done against us and to us it will not please us if the leaders above us will do that to us we know that uh, it will not be pleasing to us and we do that to those under us we're not abiding in him at that time and if we want our ministries to bear fruit we must abide in him we must live in him and do it the way he will do it he says abide in me and i in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me if i am the i'm the vine and ye are the branches he that abideth in me and i in him the same bringeth forth much fruit don't let us forget the reason why ministry is to bear fruit and many times we forget that we think i'm just there to minister because if we're conscious we are to bear fruit we'll be asking ourselves if i preach it this way present it this way proclaim it this way give it to the people this way not only preaching another thing you are doing if i do it this way and the people see that i'm doing it with a spirit of contention a spirit of strife a spirit of becoming getting even a spirit of retaliation a spirit of he did that to me i'll do this to him because you know we who come to church even those who are not leaders we we have eyes to see we have minds to think we have we have uh, our spirit our hearts to meditate and we can see through and if we see how our leaders are giving us the ministry we know whether it is in a spirit of strife a spirit of contention a spirit of retaliation a spirit of getting even and when that is done although we may do what we want to do and leave that place the people don't benefit we're not going to bear fruit we're going to make the people think of the contention rather than of the ministry we're giving up that's why in anything we're doing in the ministry give it out in love give it out the way jesus would have done it and then it says over here in verse 6 if a man abide not in me he is cast forth as a branch well we know what it means normally that if a believer does not abide in christ he backslides and he remains in sin is cut off as a branch what if a minister does not abide in christ what if a minister continually continually does not abide in the word of god 
What if a minister is continually contentious? A minister is continually striving with his congregation. A minister is continually insulting, abusing, oppressing the people of God. What if a minister is manifesting hatred continually, openly, visibly, and he does not abide in Christ? In ministry, eventually is cast off. As a minister, as a branch, and men gathered them, and it's whither men gathered them and cast them into the fire. They are burnt. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. That's what glorifies the Father. It's not just the words we speak, it's not just the time we take. It's not just the dynamite or the dynamism in us. It's the bearing fruit. They say it may look good. Is it bearing fruit? Are people being saved? Are people being encouraged? Are people being developed? Are leaders being raised up? Are we having people that can do things better than they were doing it before? That's the fruit bearing in every ministry that we represent. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. It tells us in verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that ye might, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's what the Lord is telling us, that we need to lay down very lives for our friends. That is for the people we're leading, because the people that Jesus called his friends, actually those are the disciples that he was leading in first john chapter 3 verse 16 first john chapter 3 verse 16 in first john chapter 3 verse 16 hereby perceive with the love of god because he laid down his life for us he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren what are you willing to lay down for your brethren for the people we're leading what are we willing to lay down and it's as we consider the love of jesus and the ministry of jesus and the style of jesus will lay something down some things that are precious to you as the life of christ was precious to him and he laid it down for the benefit of the people and he says what to lay our lives down for the brethren some things that you might say i love doing this i like this i appreciate this this is just me when I do it, I just I feel high, I feel great, emotionally charged. But if it's hurting your brethren, if it's not helping your brethren, if it's not helping the flowing out of a flowing of the ministry to them, can't we lay that down? For the benefit of the church, for the benefit of the ministry, that we show that practical love for the people of God. As I close, let me go through this the letters of the word leadership. And then show you how this also describes the love of Jesus in his leadership style. Focusing on Christ, Christ's leadership model, we lead by L, loving, E, equipping, A, affirming, D, discipling, E, encouraging, R, recovering, S, supporting, H, healing, healing their hearts, their emotional wounds. I, influencing. P, perfecting the people of God. As we manifest the love of Christ in our leadership style, we must be loving. You see how I put that? That's in, in continuous saying, tense. That is, in leadership, you love, you keep loving, you are loving until the very end. And then you are equipping them. That's love. That's leadership. You gather the people together, gather the youth leaders together, gather the youth together, gather the women together, gather the women leaders together, equip them. And do that not just once, and keep on equipping them, equipping them. And then as you delegate work to them, and they're doing it, you affirm them, affirming them. Uh, this is good. This is all right. Just praise a little. 
And you praise them before you blame them. You commend them before you correct them. This is good, except for this. Maybe next time, I know you'll do better. Just take care of this. Everything will be all right. Affirming them. Discipling them. Discipling them is training them. Discipling them is developing them. You are watching them. You are examining them. You are evaluating them. They need help in this area. They need development in this area. If they, if they will add this to it, things will be better for them. Encouraging them too. Sometimes uh, you give them assignment and they say, I don't think I can do it. This is above me. This is greater than me. Uh, why don't you call brother so and so, sister so and so? They will do it better. Encouraging them and telling them, No, you can do it. I'll be praying for you. Okay, try, put what you're going to do now and come and show me then I'll see how to modify it for you and I know you'll, you'll do it. Recovering them. When they have been discouraged and they are falling on their, on their faces, I don't mean falling into sin, and then they come back and they say, overseer, pastor, leader, sir, I told you I couldn't do it. And actually I made a fool of myself. I should have done better. And then you encourage, you recover them. You don't allow them to go and hide and say, I'll never do anything again. Don't call me again to that thing anymore. Recovering them and supporting them too. You support them. And you also support them. You are backing them up in prayer. And if they are hurt in any way, healing their hearts, their emotional hearts. Healing their hearts, their, their internal wounds, and then influencing them. Because that, that's leadership. Leadership is influence. When you are impacting the lives of people, influencing the life of people, inspiring the lives of people, and they say, I want to do better. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like so and so. I want to be like such and such. You are influencing them, impacting them, inspiring them, perfecting them perfecting them and of course you yourself must love perfection and excellence if you're going to encourage the people you are leading also to move towards perfection perfecting them there is much room for improvement in our leadership and this uh, week as we come together and we consider all the qualities that we're going to discuss and we're going to learn from the word of god i pray that god will make us better leaders in jesus name i said we'll be better leaders in jesus name Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Tonight we have seen love in Christ-like leadership. The Lord wants us to, to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ and in the role that we have in the church, in the things we're doing in the church. That's why the Lord brought us here so that we'll be able to follow after the leadership style of Jesus and the Lord himself will be able to move us forward, move us higher, move us to greater heights in the work of the Lord. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. You were leaders. Let's pray like leaders. Don't, 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 don't show tired as if you know we're just having general retreat and let us pray as if we're real leaders we have the mind to be like christ we have the mind to love like christ we have the mind to learn from christ we have the mind to do everything like christ we want to be more and more like him more and more like him and he prayed with all his heart he prayed fervently and he prayed with all he in fact he was sweating great drops of blood that will be done in my life oh lord you pray to the lord here that the lord himself will help you that the love of Christ will be the gauge and the guide of your life. Will be the model and the measure of your life. Will be the passion and the power of your leadership style. Talk to the Lord that he will give you great love. Great love, great love. He'll give you supreme love for God. Supreme love for God. That there will be nothing competing in your heart, in your life. Or the love of God. Supreme love for the Lord. Pray that the Lord will give you sacrificial love for sinners. That you will not forget that the sinners need to be saved. Planning programs that will get them saved. Preaching messages that will get them saved. Leading them in the way that they will want to respond to the way of salvation, to the word of salvation. Sacrificial love for sinners. Pray that the Lord will give us sanctifying love for the believers. That sanctification will be something that the believers identify, they recognize, they desire, they consecrate for, they hunger for, they, they, they are passionate about it and they pray for until they have it. That the Lord himself will help you as a leader. That you have sanctifying love for the members of the church. And you'll have submissive love for the word of God. Pray that the Lord will give you that submissive love. You read it in the word. It corrects you. It convicts you. It encourages you. It comforts you. Whatever the word of God is bringing your way. That you submit to that thing. And you have sincere love for the work of God. You love the work of God. You love the work of God. And you bring it to be number one. The privilege, the opportunity you have. Pray that God will give you more compassion. 
pray that God will make you more considerate considerate for people how people feel considerate when you talk to people what encourages people what depresses people what discourages people you'll you'll be thoughtful about what you say to people what you do to people in the church you're considerate correct you but in love examine the way you correct the people of god in the church there's room for improvement there's room for improvement and let that law be constant not fluctuating love constant 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 love because you're not loving because of your emotion you're loving because you will to love you decide to love you make up your mind to love the children the lord has given you in the ministry in the church the members of the church you just determined to love them like your biological children more than even your biological children and your love is conciliatory not divisive you're not bringing division to the house of god you are reconciling people you are uniting people you are bringing people together in fellowship constructive love not destructive constructive love you don't pull down other people you don't destroy other people you don't belittle other people you don't stamp on other people tremble on other people you don't tread on other people don't make them fearful timid make your love constructive then it will be contagious make a quality decision you are going to feed the people of God with the word of God keep loving them keep equipping them don't stop affirming them have more grace in your life that you'll keep on discipling them developing them training them encouraging them to recovering them restoring them supporting them healing their emotional wounds and their hearts influencing them inspiring them impacting their lives with good things perfecting them that's our calling may God give us the grace to fulfill that calling